People always say, Joe, that you know we only use 10% of our brain. How do they know that? Well, that was a myth that was probably created, created about 25 years ago. The reason being is because we have uh, part of our brain called the neocortex, which is our thinking brain. And uh, it's made up of uh, gray matter called nerve cells. And then underneath it is a, another part of the brain that's made of white matter. And they, there's about 10 times to 9 times amounts of white matter compared to gray matter. So mathematics was simple. Well, if there's, you know, one, you know, if there's uh, a certain percentage of gray matter and then nine times the amount of white matter, we would say, well, that white matter isn't as functional. That doesn't process thought. So the myth said, well, we use about a tenth of our brain. And so that isn't actually the truth, but if you look at functional brain scans, when you look at people when you study a brain in action, we can see that the brain doesn't work in such, you know, coherent fashions. We, we don't use, you know, all the brain at once. If you have 100 billion neurons that make up the brain, and they're seamlessly pieced together. That means we can make the brain work in different sequences, different patterns, and different combinations. And if you have 100 billion neurons, we should be able to make the brain work in many different patterns. So we're just beginning to step outside the box of what's possible. You talk about in breaking the habit of being yourself, how to lose your mind and create a new one. Tell me about that, that headline just all by itself, breaking the habit of being yourself. What does that mean? The psychological and neuroscientific model says that by the time we're 35 years old, we've memorized a set of behaviors, emotional reactions, and thought patterns that have become part of our identity. And that if 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 is a memorized set of programs, then the greatest habit we have to break is the habit of being ourselves. And let's just say that we make the assumption that the way you think has something to do with your life, or the way you think has something to do with your destiny. Well, the first thing that we have to do is we have to overcome our most present familiar environment, our, our familiar life. So if you wake up in the morning and you get out of bed and you shut the alarm clock off with the same finger that you did yesterday, if, you know, you slip into your favorite slippers, you walk into the bathroom, you use the toilet like you always do, then you look in the mirror to remember who you are, and you wash yourself off the same way as you always do, and then you drink coffee out of your favorite mug, and then you go to work by driving in the same uh, route that you did yesterday. You see the same people that push the same emotional buttons. You do the same things that you've memorized and you can do so well. And you hurry up and go home so you can hurry up and check their emails. So you can hurry up and do it all over again. You know, it begs the question, did your brain change at all that day? We could say that you were thinking the same thoughts, performing the same actions, living by the same emotional states, and secretly expecting something different to happen in your life. So neuroscience says that your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of your environment. So as you see the same people and you go to the same places and you do the same things at the same time, it's the external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain, causing you to think equal to everything that you know, react unconsciously to everything familiar in your life. And as long as you keep turning on the same circuits in the same way as you recognize the same thing, the principle in neuroscience says that nerve cells that fire together wire together. We begin to hardwire our brains into very specific patterns that reflect our external world. So to change then is to think greater than the environment, to think greater than the conditions in your life. And I think every great person in history understood this, whether it was William Wallace or Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King, Joan of Arc, uh, Queen Elizabeth I. They all had a vision. They all had an idea. And they were so um, uh, passionate about that idea that they, they couldn't live any other way. So it begs the question, can you believe in a future that you can't see or experience with your senses yet, that you've thought about enough times in your mind that your brain has literally changed to look like that event has already happened? Now, the neuroscientific model of reality says it's absolutely possible that we can change our brains just by thinking differently. And to change, then, is to overcome the present associations in your life to begin to think and act greater than those conditions. How important, Joe, is positive thinking? Well, this isn't positive thinking, George, because... Uh, no, it's not. I know. Because a lot of times, you know, let's just, let's just break this down. Every time we have a thought, we make a chemical. If we have a great thought or an unlimited thought, we turn on a set of circuits in our brain in a very specific sequence or pattern that produces a level of mind that signals another part of the brain that makes a chemical for us to feel exactly the way we're just thinking, great or unlimited. If we have a negative thought or an unhappy thought, we turn on a different set of circuits in the brain that produce a different level of mind that makes a different blend of chemicals to make us feel exactly the way we're just thinking, negative or unhappy. Now, the moment we begin to feel the way we think, because the brain is in constant communication with the body, we begin to think the way we feel, which makes more chemicals for us to feel the way we think and think the way we feel, 
And this cycle of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking creates what I call a state of being. So if a person has an insecure thought, they begin to feel insecure. The moment they feel insecure, they think more insecure thoughts. And this cycle goes on for certain people for 20 or 30 years until they say, I am insecure. And whenever we say, I am anything, the mind and body are working together. Now, it's the repetition of this cycle of thinking and feeling over time that conditions the body to be the mind. Now, when the body becomes the mind, that's called a habit. <clears throat> so then, if that is a subconscious program, then 5% of the conscious mind is trying to work against 95% of what the person has memorized uh, subconsciously. So if the person's thinking positively with the 5% of their conscious mind, but they've been feeling negatively for the last 25 years, that's mind and body in opposition. If the person's praying for a new life and a new opportunity, but they're feeling guilty, that's mind and body in opposition. So positive thinking doesn't work a lot of the times because the person is working against how they internally feel, which is uh, negatively. We have to literally become somebody else. And so my model is very simple. Forget about the experience. Because by thinking about the experience or talking about the experience, you're beginning to fire and wire those circuits in your brain to reinforce, reaffirm that identity. And if you work yourself up into an emotional state, you begin to recondition your body into the past. I say, forget about the event. Just work on the emotion and begin to unmemorize those emotions. And as you begin to overcome an emotion, a memory without the emotional charge is called wisdom, and that's the name of the game. That's why we're here. My interest has always been in demystifying the mystical. I think this is a time in history where... People not only want to know, but they want to know how. And so the word meditation literally means to become familiar with, to make known. The symbol in uh, ancient Tibetan means to become familiar with. Now, because of the size of our frontal lobe, that's the crowning achievement of a human being. It's 40% of our entire brain. That's what separates us from all other species. You know, the next closest species, primates and gibbons, about 14 to 17%. Dogs are about 7%. And for cats, it's about 3.5%. Now, the frontal lobe is where we begin to pay attention or become conscious of who we are. That, that concept in neuroscience is called metacognition. The fact that we can observe our thoughts, we can pay attention to our behaviors, we can notice how we feel, it means that we could modify our behaviors to do a better job in life. If you're noticing your unconscious thoughts because you've closed your eyes and eliminated the environment, you become aware of your, your, you know, your unconscious or habits or behaviors and you begin to feel your emotions that are typically driving you to the same state, the fact that you're beginning to observe them means now you're no longer the program, but you're the consciousness observing the program. So the first step in meditation, then, is the unlearning process. It's to become aware of, of the old self, the aspects of ourselves that we want to change, to so go into the operating system of those subconscious programs and bring them to our conscious awareness so that we have dominion over them and a better ability to change them. Now, the second part of meditation, if we look at the word to become familiar with again, means then as we begin to think of new ways of being, as we begin to speculate new possibilities, that frontal lobe turns on again, and it's like a great symphony leader. It looks out over the landscape of the entire brain, and if we said, well, what is compassion, or what is joy, or what is freedom? Well, it, it begins to assemble all these different networks of neurons, and it combines them in different patterns. Whenever we begin to make the brain work differently, now we're changing the mind. And so in the first step, we're, we're unfiring and unwiring those neurons, and then we begin to biologically prune away the old self. As we begin to think about new ways of being and speculate possibilities, we begin to fire and wire new sequences and new patterns, and we begin to install the neurological hardware. And if we practice that every day, we begin to become familiar with a new self, and that becomes the very platform of our, our identity. According to the neuroscientific model, this principle that we call neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity says that we're changed by every thought we think, uh, every behavior or choice that we make that's different in the past, uh, every dream that we speculate, uh, every vision that we have, our brain literally reorganizes itself to reflect a new level of mind. So given the right uh, learning and the right instruction and the right feedback from the neuroplastic model, People can evolve out of an old self and literally re-enter into a new self. The key is, is to be able to sustain that change independent of the environment, which, of course, causes us to return back to the old self. Your body is your greatest mind reader in the world. Your body is 
uh, precognitive. In other words, your body is ahead of your conscious mind. Now, when most people make a decision to change, you know, they're typically sitting on a the couch, they have the remote control in their hand, they have the computer to the right, they have the smartphone to the left, and they say, yeah, I think I'm going to change tomorrow. And so the body, as the unconscious mind, doesn't get the signal that the person is really going to make any significant change. The body already knows that that person's not coming out of their resting state to change. <laughs> but if you ever said to yourself, I'm going to do this, and you say, I don't care what's going on in my life, that's the environment. I don't care how I feel, that's your body. I don't care how long it takes, that's time. I'm going to do this, and the hair on the back of your neck stands up. The body gets a very strong signal, and that type of signal begins to rewrite those programs. Most people, and this is the human condition, wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis or loss to get about the business of change. And we reach our lowest denominator, and all of a sudden we start to get serious and we begin to examine who we're being. Or, you know, we can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering, or we can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. I think my message is why wait? Why wait till we reach the lowest denominator before we make that decision? So when we reach that lowest point, we get serious enough where we can't go on being the same person any longer. And, and, and when we reach that point, I'm, you know, it's kind of a human condition. That's when we really say, okay, let me look at the thoughts I no longer want to believe in about myself or my life, and let me begin to examine my habits and behavior that, that undermining my efforts or my goals, and let me look at these emotions that aren't loving to myself, and let me choose something else. We can do that, you know, with the training to understand. Well, one of the things, for example, Joe, that, that I have a difficult time grasping, for example, New Year's resolutions. I mean, we, we come up to the new year, and people try to set goals and objectives for themselves, whether it's a better job or to lose weight or a better relationship. But they always tend to put it off until New Year. So they, you know, they make that resolution. I'm this. I'm going to lose 35 pounds in the new year. Why don't they just do it right then? Well, this is the, the reason I wrote Breaking the Habit, and this is the biggest reason why it's so hard to change, because we start out with really good intentions. We make a declaration, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to be healthy, you know, I'm going to exercise, and then two hours later, most people are sitting on the couch and they're, they're watching their favorite Eating a pizza. They're eating a pizza and eating ice cream, and they, they've gone unconscious. Which is now. not an idea, bad idea later, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we examine this, let's, let's take a look at this, because we said 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a set of uh, unconscious thoughts, behaviors, and emotions or emotional reactions that are literally happening behind the scenes of our awareness. So if that's 95% of who we are. The people will give you an example. A great example that I like to use is, you know, if you grab the telephone, and, uh, well, you'd have to be over 35 for this, but if you, if you couldn't consciously remember a phone number and you walked over to the receiver and you looked at the receiver, the moment you looked at the receiver, you would be able to dial that phone number. You couldn't consciously remember it, but your body practiced it so many times that it knew better than your brain. It just knows what to do. That's called the procedural memory, and that's a great example of a subconscious program. So we have all these subconscious programs. So then the moment we see some person or we go to our favorite place or we start doing the same things, we begin to go unconscious. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to get beyond the operating system uh, of the conscious mind and enter into the subconscious operating system to make those changes. In other words, most people are trying to use 5% of their conscious mind to work against 95% of what they've memorized subconsciously. So they, they plan a new life consciously, but they feel uh, unworthy. That's mind and body in opposition. They begin to think about being wealthy, but they feel poor. And so we have to begin to understand that there's a science that says we can begin to change the brain and body ahead of the environment. And that really that's what the Breaking the Habit is about. Now, when you take what you learn intellectually and you apply it or you personalize it, or you demonstrate it. It means now you're going to have to modify your behavior in some way, change your action. And when you do that, you have a new experience. So now, in the midst of an experience, everything you're seeing and smelling and tasting and feeling and hearing, all of your five senses are immersed into the external environment. And as your brain is beginning to gather all of this sensory data, all that information is rushing back to your brain, and jungles of neurons are beginning to organize themselves into patterns. The moment those neurons string into place, they release a chemical, and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. When that happens, we activate the second brain, called the limbic brain, or the emotional brain, or the chemical brain. So, you read the book on forgiveness, and you have all this information stored in your thinking brain, or you read the book on how to hit a baseball, 
Now, all of that information you have to do something with. Now, when you get your behaviors to match your intentions, or you get your actions equal to your thoughts, or you get your body involved in some way, when you actually change your actions, that experience begins to reinforce the circuits in your brain neurologically, and it begins to chemically condition or chemically instruct your body to teach it what your mind is intellectually understood. All right, but I may get this book on how to play the piano, and I may read it cover to cover three times. I still may never be a great piano player, Joe. True. Well, there's a couple ingredients that allow us to get to that point. One of it is attention. And when we pay attention to what we're doing, attention is one of the key elements that allows us to begin to unify mind and body. So if a person can't restrain their impulsive habits and behavior and begin to um, get their uh, body to, re to respond in different ways. If they can't get that, that alignment working, more than likely they won't be able to develop a skill. But let's just say, though, that a person continues to practice through repetition. They keep doing something over and over again. If we keep doing something and re-experiencing the same event, we begin to neurochemically condition the body to memorize that behavior as well as, a, as the conscious mind. And whenever the mind and body are working together, now we're in a state of being and we activate that third brain called the cerebellum. That's the seat of the subconscious. That's where we've practiced so much, something so many times, we don't have to think about it any longer. Are you particularly spiritual? Do you believe in a divine creator? I ask you that because, you know, to me, you're a scientist right now, and I'd, and I'd love to get your views on whether you think this all had some design behind it. Well, I, I, uh, I, I consider myself a spiritual person because... When you begin to study science and you begin to look at the nature of reality, uh, if you're not fascinated by the fact that, you know, our heart beats over two gallons of blood in a minute over, a, you know, a hundred, a, a, a 200 gallons of blood in an hour over, you know, 100,000 times in one day through 60,000 miles of blood vessels, and, uh, you know, we lose 10 million cells every second and we make 10 mil million cells the next second, or that in one cell um, uh, it goes through the order of 100,000 chemical reactions in one second, uh, if, you're, if we don't begin to look at something that's giving us life, some intelligence that's organizing these functions, um, I think we, we go from a very, uh, uh, we, we start to reduce uh, life down to a very mechanistic model. And I think the more that I learn and the more that I study, the more I begin to realize that that's not how things really are. And, and you know, with the, with the advent of quantum physics and the understanding that there is a, the subjective mind has some effect on our objective world, start to give us permission to become empowered and to begin to take control of our destiny. You've talked about meditation on the program before, um, earlier, but different people would have different views on what meditation is, Joe, and yours is not like most. Tell me about that. Well, I always say that if you get up from this, your meditation as the same person who sat down, nothing's really happened to you neurologically, biologically, genetically, or epigenetically. Nothing's happened to you in terms of change. I mean, we have to get up and we have to feel differently than, than when we sat down. And if we begin to look at some of the latest research in studying uh, brainwave patterns, and a lot of the research being done at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but we have different types of brainwaves. I mean, we're talking right now and we're interacting, and for the most part, our brainwaves are in what's called beta brainwave patterns. That's thinking brainwave patterns. That's our analytical mind. We need that beta pattern to be able to navigate in our external world. And in beta, because of the patterns that are created, we're perking up our neocortex and we're trying to create meaning between the outer world and the inner world. That's really the mechanism of the brain, to create coherence or meaning between what's going outside of us, going on outside of us, and what's going on inside of us. So when we're functioning in reality, we're producing beta wave patterns. Now, when you close your eyes and you begin to eliminate the external environment and you begin to you know, reduce the amount of sensory information that's coming to your brain, your brainwave patterns begin to slow down into what's called alpha brainwaves. Now, in alpha, the inner world tends to be more real than the outer world. And children usually from the ages of 0 to 7 or 10 usually are functioning normally in alpha. And that's why you can tell a child to act like a rabbit at 9 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon, she's still hopping around in the kitchen because the imaginary world is that real. If we begin to relax the body a little bit more, like um, when you're going to sleep and you begin to fall into a, a light sleep where the body begins to fall asleep and the mind is awake, that's called theta. Now, this is what I call magic land because I said that a habit is when the body becomes the mind. So if we've 
put the body to sleep and it's no longer the mind, this is where change can happen the quickest. Now, delta is deep sleep. That's when the person's in a restorative state, and that's pretty much when they're unconscious. There's very little active conscious uh, functioning in their neocortex. Now, most people move up and down the scale when they go to bed at night. They're going from beta to alpha to theta to delta. And when they wake up in the morning, because of brain chemistry, they're going from delta to theta to alpha to beta. Now, what the whole purpose of meditation is to get beyond the analytical mind and begin to move into the operating system of the subconscious mind where all of those programs exist. Is it kind of like trying to break down a layer or some kind of a shell? It's kind of, you know, so it's about slowing down your thinking brain. Now, here's most people's problem. Most people try to analyze their problems within the emotions that they're, try, that they're living by. And emotions are literally a record of your past experiences. So the solution is outside of that emotion beyond your analysis. So most people, as they begin to analyze their problems, they drive their brain more into that higher beta pattern, and it moves them separate from the operating system to make the change. So when we begin to do our meditation, according to the latest research, it, there's absolute ways that we can begin to slow brainwave patterns down to begin to move from the conscious mind into the subconscious mind to make those changes. And the type of brainwave pattern that seems to be the hot topic in neuroscience right now is what's called coherent brainwave patterns. Now, coherence is when, you know, um, everything is operating in rhythm, when there's orderliness, when there's, uh, when there's um, um, a rhythm, when there's synchronous, you know, synchrony, when everything's beginning to work together. And when the brainwave patterns move into that orderliness or that synchrony, it's, it's a very specific way that the brain begins to work in a holistic fashion. And different compartments of the brain that are no longer communicating with each other because of the hormones of stress all of a sudden move into balance, and they begin to hold hands, and they, we begin to experience more wholeness or more orderliness, and we feel more like ourselves than we have in a long time. And, and that's that meditative state where, where we begin to relax and we begin to feel so good that we're no longer being affected by the external world. Now, this is the beauty, because if you practice this type of coherence and you begin to create this orderliness, the research shows that when the, the incoherence of your external environment no longer knocks you out of balance because you've memorized such a state of orderliness and coherence. So I use science pretty much as the model to begin to demystify meditation. And people who actually practice it and do it, it's a skill, just like golf or tennis. The more you practice it, and the more you're able to remove yourself beyond your identity. That's when the, the brain and body happens to recalibrate and move back to order. Let me ask you about people who generally are intuitive. Do they have different kind of brain functions in order to do that? They actually do. Uh, most people who are intuitive uh, don't analyze uh, with their uh, thinking neocortex. They tend to uh, slow that thinking part of their brain down, and they trust, for the most part, imagery or stream of consciousness that is beyond their critical analytical mind because the moment they start to rationalize what they're doing, they move out of the part of the brain where they, where they actually uh, uh, have that skill. So and the answer to the question is absolutely yes. They, they slow down their thinking brain in order to pick up information. That is remarkable all by itself, isn't it? It is, and, and that's a great example of quantum physics and non-locality. I mean, the fact that our awareness is so mobile, and that's really the privilege of being a human being. You know, we can... We can unfold the past bitter memory that's tattooed in the recesses of our gray matter. And, the, you know, in the moment it comes to life, and to the, in that moment it's real to us. So we can begin to forecast some worst-case scenario that's going to happen in our, in our future. And we can obsess about it to the exclusion of everything else so that the body begins to subconsciously or physiologically change as if it's in that future event in the moment. So if that's the case, can we begin to mobilize our awareness uh, outside of time and space and to begin to pick up information that exists uh, uh, outside of linear time. What is, in your opinion, the most important thing that people should be aware of if they want to change? Or, or even why change? Well, I think most of us uh, memorize certain emotions that become part of our identity. You know, when we react to something in our life, some condition in our life, as I said, the end product of an experience is an emotion. What most people don't know is that when they react to something in their life, there's a refractory period of chemicals that are created from that experience. And if you don't know how to control that emotional reaction, and you allow that refractory period to last for hours or even days, that's called a mood. So you see someone and you say to them, 
what's wrong? And they say, well, I'm in a mood. And you say, well, why are you in a mood? And they say, well, this thing happened to me five days ago. And what that really means is the same emotion, chemicals, are running through their body that are keeping them connected to a past experience. Now, if you keep that refractory period going on for weeks or even months, that's called a temperament. So you say, why is that guy so angry? Oh, why does he have such an angry temperament? And so you ask him, why are you so angry? And he says, well, this thing happened to me 10 months ago. And what he's really saying is, this thing happened to me 10 months ago, and I'm memorizing my emotional reaction. Now, if we keep that same refractory period going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. So we tend to develop our personality based on past experiences that emotionally brand us. So in order to change our personality, we have to look at the emotions that we've memorized that's become part of our identity. And so to shorten refractory period of our emotional reactions is called emotional intelligence. And people who tend to hold on to experiences then uh, tend to live by those emotions which keep them anchored in the past. And we can't go to a new future. We can't create a new life or a new future holding on to the emotions of the past. We have to begin to layer by layer begin to uh, memorize those emotional states. And that's what the part three of the book is about. What emotion have you memorized that's become part of your identity? That's actually not who you are. It's just your memory of the past. And so when you teach people how to, to change those emotional states, you liberate some energy. And of course, they see a new landscape that they never saw be before because they're not perceiving reality uh, through the filter of that emotion. They're not, they're not looking at reality through the past. The, the Newtonian model of reality is about cause and effect. In other words, the external environment, something outside of us, um, changes how we feel inside of us. And when we notice right. that we feel altered inside of us, we pay attention to whoever or whatever uh, caused that. Events occur, right? Right. That's, right. that cause and effect is really uh, us living at the uh, victims to the environment. Now, but, you know, the, the, the true aspect of change isn't, is, it has nothing to do with the environment changing how we think and feel. The true aspect of change is, coming out of our resting state and changing how we think and feel independent of the environment. And when we change how we think and feel independent of the environment and we can maintain that modified state of mind and body, now we're no longer living at cause and effect, but now we are, in fact, causing an effect. This is where people begin to feel empowered. So you and I have been hypnotized and conditioned into believing that we need a reason for joy, that we need a reason for gratitude, we need a reason to feel good. That's that Newtonian model of cause and effect. The quantum model says this. Your subjective mind, how you think and feel, produces measurable effects. But I think that most people, you know, the model is our personality creates our personal reality. It's that simple. And our personality is made up of how we think, how we act, and how we feel. So the present personality who's listening on, on the radio show today uh, has created their present personal reality called their life, which means then if you wanted to create a new personal reality, a new life, you would have to change on some fundamental level the thoughts you think, the behaviors that you demonstrate, and the emotions that you live by. So if we need a reason for gratitude, we need a reason for joy, then we're at effect. We're always waiting for something to happen. The quantum model says, let's begin to move into an elevated state. Let's begin to condition the body into believing that that future event is happening to us now. And when we, when we make time for ourselves to, to practice this, then we're no longer li living life as materialists any longer, using our senses to define reality. We're actually changing inside of us in mind and body and then looking for the effects outside of us. And when people begin to understand that that's possible, uh, change becomes uh, more, uh, more inspiring. As we begin to unmemorize those emotions and we begin to close the gap between how we appear and who we are, that's called transparency. And layer by layer, when we begin to make those changes inside of us, every time we unmemorize an emotion, we liberate energy out of the body. Now, if a person is living by certain emotions that they can't change, then their body is literally living in the past. Now, the body is the unconscious mind, George, and it does not know the difference between an experience in your life that produces an emotion and an emotion that you fabricate by thought alone. So a person who's living in a cycle of emotion that creates thoughts, that creates emotions, that creates thoughts, this loop, the body, as the unconscious mind, is literally living in the past, and it's believing that it's in the same circumstances 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's that type of chemical redundancy that begins to push the genetic buttons that begin to create disease. So as the person begins to unmemorize those emotions, they begin to liberate energy out of the body, and the body is free from the chains of those emotions. And that liberation of energy is called joy, and that joy doesn't come from outside of them. It actually comes from inside of them, and they begin to make those changes, uh, not from trying to make the feeling go away but by some thing or some substance or some action, but because they've overcome some aspect of themselves 
and they begin to feel liberated. And that's what I call the natural state of being. So if people want to start changing, what do you recommend? What are the first things they start to do? Do they have to identify what that is, what they want to fix? Absolutely. I mean, uh, anytime we want to change anything, we got to first look at what is it that we want to change. And so, um, you know, most people think that change happens outside of them. You know, like if we get rid of this person or if we kick the cat out of the house or it has something to do with changing, you know, our external, external conditions. And really, the first aspect of change is really noticing how you think. Begin to become conscious of those emotions that bring you to a lower denominator every day and become aware of your habits and behaviors that keep producing the same experiences that keep reaffirming the same emotions. And this process, not a lot of people like to light a match in a dark place, but the process of change really is becoming conscious of those unconscious states. So, you know, people say, well, where do I start? And I say, look, it's very simple. We're so distracted by our external environment that we wake up every day and do the same things as we started the show with, and we, we begin to reproduce the same levels of mind that begin to become automatic programs. Sit down in the morning and ask yourself this question. What is the greatest ideal or the expression of myself that I want to be today? And you begin to say, let me remind myself the thoughts of the thoughts that keep me returning back to the old self. Let me begin to review and begin to become aware of my unconscious habits so that I'm so aware of them and so conscious that they would never slip by me unnoticed today. And what are the emotions that keep me returning back to the same self that really are just a reflection of my past? And as we begin to remind ourselves who we no longer want to be and we become conscious of those unconscious states, we're more prone to, in our waking day, not slip back to the old self sitting on the couch who just said earlier that they wanted to get in shape. And then if you said, what are the thoughts that I do want to put my energy behind? What are the uh, behaviors I do want to demonstrate? And what are the emotions? What elevated emotions do I want to live by today? And if you said, I'm not going to get up from this meditation until I am this person, we would say then that the moment you began to think differently, you would begin to make your brain work in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations. And when you begin to speculate possibilities and begin to forecast new outcomes, and your brain begins to work differently, you're changing your mind. Now, when you do that repeatedly and you remind yourself who you want to be every day, you begin to install the neurological circuitry in your brain to look like the experience has already happened. In other words, as you begin to think differently and as you begin to plan new behaviors, your brain does not know the difference between the actual experience in your life that produces those circuitry circuits or what you fabricate by thought alone, which means we can change our brain just by thinking differently. Now, if we're so involved in that thought process that the thought in our mind literally becomes an experience, the end product of an experience is called an emotion. As we're sitting there in our comfort of our own home and we're beginning to think about a new way of being and reminding ourselves who we do want to be, if the thought becomes the experience, Thoughts are the language of the brain, but feelings are the language of the body. And the moment the body begins to get a chemical signal because you begin to embrace that event, your body begins to epigenetically change, and you move into a new state of being. Now, if you said, I'm going to memorize this state so that nothing, no person, no thing, no experience is going to remove me from this the remainder of my day, we could say that that new state of being is a new personality. And a new personality then, of course, creates a new personal reality. Joe, what are epigenetics? Well, they used to say, neuroscience used to say, biology used to say that, you know, genes were the cause of disease. And now we know that it's a scientific fact that, you know, less than 5% of the people on the planet are born with a genetic condition. The other 95% of the conditions are created from lifestyle, from choices. And <clears throat> genes then are actually what make proteins. And we actually have... Uh, a gene that can begin to regulate in 2,000 different variations. The same gene can begin to, vary, uh, begin to function in 2,000 two different variations. And when the environment or the, the, the chemistry outside of the cell signals the gene in a different way, the gene begins to respond differently, and, and that's uh, epigenetics. We've been teaching these workshops pretty much around the world for the last uh, three years, and we've witnessed some pretty amazing changes in people's lives. And as I said, the hardest part of all of this is making the time to do it. If you took 40 minutes out of your day and you began to follow a very a specific a program and you stuck with it for a period of time, you would begin to change your mind and body. And when you change your mind and body, you're moving into a new state of being. So it takes a little bit of effort, 
And just like any skill, in the beginning, you have to restrain certain impulsive behaviors. You've got to begin to focus a little bit better. You've got to stay consistent with it. But if you do, we know, in fact, that it works. The, the work through all this, um, when, when people are trying to change, is it okay to go to a friend and say, what, what would you change about me <laughs> if you could do that? <laughs> we always joke around about, the, uh, about this in our workshops because men tend to be the ones that always say, you know, I really, I think I'm doing okay. <laughs> and their wife is standing next to them shaking, shaking their, their heads, head, yeah. saying, no, he really isn't. And so if people have difficulties, you know, they're so busy, you know, they're so absorbed in being who they think is, is okay, uh, and they can't uh, be objective enough to see themselves from another point of view. Of course, it's always a good idea to get someone who loves you enough to tell you the truth to say, man, uh, wow, you, are, you really complain a lot, or man, you really make excuses for yourself. Well, sometimes the outsider sees it better than the individual. Yeah, the observer from the outside, absolutely. Yeah. What kind of results after four or five weeks do people see? Well, we've seen, you know, just amazing things happen over the, the course of, uh, of, of four weeks or even less. Um, you know, as I've been saying all along, the process of change through the biological model requires unlearning and relearning. It requires breaking the habit of the old self and then reinventing the new self. It requires what we call in neuroscience pruning synaptic connections, which means you no longer fire and you no longer wire the same circuits and you biologically change uh, your circuitry and then to sprout and fire and wire new connections in your circuit. It requires unmemorizing emotions that exist uh, in your body and then reconditioning your body to a new mind and to a new emotion. It requires moving from your past memories into some future memories. And so um, everybody says, you know, to change a habit, it takes 21 days. That actually, there's no real science to prove that. It, it, there's a lot of variables that, that allow us to, uh, to change. I mean, it has to do with... Uh, you know, your attention span, how long in the process uh, you do it, if you do it every single day, um, how often you do it. There's a lot of variables that, that create change. But what we've seen with people uh, uh, doing our meditations is that we've seen people diagnosed with MS, with lupus, uh, with um, thyroid conditions like uh, Hashimoto syndrome. We've seen people with uh, cancers, uh, diabetes, uh, chronic pain, uh, um, all kinds of physical ailments, literally, uh, move from uh, living in those states, and when they became somebody else, they began to signal new genes in new ways, and, and as they began to change their mind and body, uh, they literally became somebody else, and, and they got uh, pretty healthy. For some people, the release is emotional. Other people, it's just the opposite. It's absolutely free, that they're, when they're freed from uh, those emotional states that keep them in such pain or in such torture, uh, there's, a, there's a liberation of energy, and so it could come across is uh, laughing, it could come across as crying, it could come across as a big emotional release in terms of a sound. Uh, we've seen all kinds of things, but really it's when the body's liberated. And when the body has that moment of liberation, it doesn't want, it doesn't want to live in that state any longer. It wants to be free. And, and so we've seen all kinds of uh, what we call ab reactions or emotional reactions that take place. But it's not necessary. Our guest, Dr. Joe Dispenza, we're talking about his work, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, How to Simply Lose Your Mind and Create a New One, Male, Female. Does it work for both? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, we've seen it work uh, across the board, young, old. You know, people always say, God, I'm too old to change. And I always say, really, have you seen the latest research on stroke victims? That, that if you, if you uh, have a stroke and you give the person the right knowledge and the right uh, instruction and they stay um, diligent with it, that the brain can literally rewire itself around a lesion and people can regain um, uh, mobility back. And that's, uh, that's been done many times and reproduced many times. So, and these people were in their 70s, and some of them had strokes, uh, had paralysis for years. So the brain is that neuroplastic. If you give it the right learning, you give it the right information, and then the right instruction and the right feedback, um, the brain can literally rewire itself. See, there was a, a man that um, was diagnosed with um, cancer, and um, he was actually on an elevator, and uh, when he was... Uh, getting off the floor, there was a man standing next to him who was a dermatologist, and the dermatologist pulled him off the elevator and said, hey, uh, can I take a look at your face here? And he said, you know, you have cancer on your face, uh, malignant cancer. So this man scheduled the, the typical procedure. He had, um, uh, you know, he had it frozen, he had it cut out, and then, of course, he had it radiated. And then uh, about four months later, it appeared on his neck larger. Oh. So then he, he had it, you know, same procedure, frozen, cut out, and radiated. Three or four months later, it came back on his side. Uh, he did the same procedure. 
And finally, it showed up on his calf, and that was about the size of an apricot. So he said, um, well, he had seen the movie What the Bleep Do We Know that uh, I was in, and then he read my book and read a couple other books, and he began to reason, like, well, what is this marble rolling around in my brain that keeps creating this condition? Now, if emotions are the end product of experience, he began to look at it. He said, what emotion have I memorized that keeps signaling the same gene in the same way uh, every single day? And he realized when he sat down and looked at himself that he lived his whole life in resentment, resented someone or something every day. Jeez. And uh, so he began to look at the thoughts that created the resentment. You know, in other words, when he was feeling resentment, what were the thoughts that he would think? And he listed them all down. He wrote them all down. And he became conscious of every single thought, so none of those thoughts would slip by his awareness again. And then he said, what are the behaviors that I demonstrate? What do I do? What do I say when I'm feeling this emotion? And he began to observe himself in his life, and he wrote down every behavior, every action, every verbalization that he made when he felt resentment. And then he said, what are the other emotions that are created from resentment? Do I, do, do I judge? Do I, am I impatient? And he began to become conscious of his unconscious self. And he reviewed this list every single day. And what he didn't know that he was doing is that he was biologically no longer firing, and no longer wiring the same circuits in his brain, and he was no longer emotionally signaling the same genes in the same way that created the disease. After about five or six days, he started to feel really lifted. He started to feel really good because he began to break that emotional state. He began to say, when I go back into my life, who do I want to be? And he began to think about the thoughts he did want to believe in and the behaviors he did want to demonstrate and the emotions that he did want to live by. And as he began to think in new and unusual ways, he moved into a new state of being. And, and uh, when he returned back into his life about 10 days later, he was in the shower getting ready for the surgery uh, to have the cancer removed. And as, uh, when he was in the shower, he looked down at his leg, and the cancer literally had fallen off his leg, it literally just fell off. That's amazing. And he became somebody else. And a new personality creates a new personal reality, and he was totally healed. It's an amazing concept that the body is the unconscious mind. In other words, it doesn't know the difference between an experience that produces an emotion and a thought that creates the emotion. What most people don't know is that when they begin to think about a past experience, they produce the same chemistry in the brain and in the body as if the event, as if the event was happening. Now, you do that over and over again. You begin to literally condition the body emotionally to become the mind. So. It's now the energy or the emotion is stored in the body. It's not stored in the mind. It's literally in the body. So there's a whole new field emerging uh, that's really helping people. Um, that's really what's called the energy psychology movement or, or what, what I call implicit change movement in which we're addressing the body. We're no longer doing talk therapy because that doesn't change anything. So when you do massage or you do um, um, acupuncture or chiropractic or what's called EFT or EMDR or psych K or body talk, this is all addressing the body as the subconscious mind. And when we begin to release that energy that's stored in the body, it's literally like taking a log out of a log jam. And the person has a lot of waste that begins to, uh, to be released. The body begins to reorganize itself. <clears throat> the person literally views their life from a different place because they feel better. And when they feel better, they begin to make different choices. They begin to think differently. They begin to behave differently. And they literally step out of the past. I logged off of Facebook. Um, it, it seemed to give me a false uh, connection to people, even to people in my past, even to people around me. They'd push stuff, and I knew the stuff they posted was bogus. But it just, it, and then pretty soon, I, it was like a novelty thing. Okay, you know. But now, then I was like, I check in. It's like, well, someone didn't write me, or what? Isn't there more to this experience? <laughs> it was like a weight on me. Sure. It, it gave me, and, and when I signed off, it it just felt a little bit more that I could address my own issues and my own future rather than kind of wasting my time in the past or a false reality. And I'll take your, your comments on the air. Well, I, That's I, a pretty I good analogy, that. isn't it, Joe? It's a great, it's a great um, <clears throat> choice that you made. Um, and let's talk about reaffirming an identity. You know, we reaffirm our, our identity emotionally and neurologically by the things that we repeatedly do. So if we're looking outside of ourselves constantly, to try to make some feeling go away inside of us, and we're distracting ourselves from those feelings, as we said earlier, we literally get lost in um, the confusion of who we think we are. The moment we begin to make other choices, look, when you, when you play a computer game or you search on, you um, interact on Facebook, what most people don't know is that every time 
something that you do uh, during the computer game or during the Facebook makes you feel good, it, it begins to turn on the pleasure centers in your brain, and your brain begins to squirt out a certain amount of dopamine, which makes you feel good. Now, if you keep doing that repeatedly, the pleasure centers begin to recalibrate at a higher level, and you become dependent on something outside of you to make you feel good. And then if something doesn't, uh, you expect something to happen on Facebook and it doesn't happen, then you don't get the high that you're looking for, so then you, you, try, to, you try to create it by, by staying on it longer. And, and that sounds like an addiction to me. So as we begin to um, remove ourselves from the things that hijack our pleasure centers, uh, we, begin to, we begin to find more balance in our brain and body. And, and the, the bottom line is, is that if you keep doing that extensively and the pleasure centers get hijacked to such a high level, then we can't find pleasure in anything. We can't go watch a sunset. We can't you know, go visit an elder. Uh, or we can't uh, take the dog for a walk because we're, we're overstimulated to such a degree. And that's what technology is really doing for a lot of people. And, and so that's a great choice because it's really changing your brain chemistry back to normal, and you'll begin to feel more like yourself than you have in a long time. Joe, is an addiction mental or physical? Oh, it's both. <clears throat> an addiction is something you can't stop. It feels really good while you're doing it, and it feels really bad when you stop it. And so if you think about any addiction, if you're angry, right, and I said to you, hey, why are you so angry? Why don't you just stop? Well, if you can't stop the anger, then there's an addiction to anger. If you're playing a video game and I say, hey, it's time for dinner, you know, break it down, and you can't stop the video game, then that's an addiction. If you're you know, uh, interacting on Facebook, and you have, to, you have to check your Facebook page every 15 minutes or so, and you can't stop that, that sounds like an addiction to me. So there's huh. neurological, biological, and physiological components that ultimately lead to physical changes. If you take that child and, you, and they spend an hour playing video games, and now they go to school, and learning should be a reward in and of itself, but now they can't get their brain to turn on because they just overstimulated it and they can't learn, and what do you think they do to turn their brain on? They act out. They get in trouble to release adrenaline and, and epinephrine to, or to get their brain wo woken up for a period of time, and that begins to create attention problems. Now, fast forward 20 years down the line when this, when this child is now an adult, and, and they have to address some really uncomfortable situations emotionally in their life. Instead of facing those conditions and actually moving through them, they'll try to escape by trying to make that uncomfortable feeling go away, and that's when we start to create a culture of addiction. So as long as it doesn't interfere with your normal life, and as long as you can stop it uh, so that you can function, uh, then, then it's, it's a healthy thing. It's passion. It's, it's a single-minded focus. But when it begins to interfere with, in, our, in, our, uh, in our sleep or interfere with our eating patterns or interfere with our family life or interfere with some uh, things that we do and it begins to begin, uh, become uh, predictable and um, patterned, then we've got to start looking at how we can change it. Name of the book, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Joe, thanks so much, and uh, good luck.